For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As high as the heavens with author Kate Breslin, coming up next right here on The Right Stuff. You are listening to the best, the only, the only place to be on Tuesday night. That's right. You're listening to The Right Stuff, and you're at the right place at the right time. From England to Canada, from Detroit to the Coconos, we are showcasing Christian authors worldwide, giving you tips, tools, techniques, and resources for you, the writer, to hone and perfect your craft. Tune in every Tuesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time right here on WPJC 104.5. And your host, Parker J. Hi and welcome to the show. I am so glad you are here with me today. It is going to be a great show and a great week. And let me tell you why it's going to be a great week. The reason why is because I get to meet you. I will be at the Southern California Christian Writers Conference tomorrow. It starts Thursday, but I'll be in California tomorrow. I am looking forward to meeting you if you're in the California area. If you're at the conference, I can't wait to meet you. I'm so, so excited. I have told you over and over again for the past several months, the Southern California Christian Writers Conference is going to be a blast. Some of the authors that you've heard on this show are going to be there. Tosca Lee is going to be there. So many others are going to be there. And guess what? Moi. I'm going to be there, too. So I'm really excited about it. As the queen of Tuesday nights, Parker J., I'm just so excited I'm going to be there to talk with you and share my insights about writing and Christian fiction in general. I cannot wait to see you there. So if you're going to be at the Southern California Christian Writers Conference, I cannot wait to meet you. I'm also very excited because my book, Time to Say Goodbye, is almost complete. I've been doing a lot of writing. As, as you know, writing is a, is a chore sometimes, but it's a great chore. And the book is almost complete. And when that's complete, I'm going to be able to give you the publication date of when it's going to be out. Now, here's the thing. If you want an ARC copy of that book, all you have to do is simply sign up for my newsletter. If you sign up for my newsletter, I'll go ahead and give you an ARC copy of the book. And I would love for you, if you feel like it, to leave a review when it's out. Love to get your feedback on it. Hate it. Love it. I want your feedback. I've told you over and over again, authors need feedback. Feedback helps us breathe at night. It lets us know whether we're doing what we're supposed to do with our words or we're not doing it with supposed to do with our words. So we definitely want to hear from you. So make sure that if you sign up for my newsletter at parkerjcole.com, you can get an ARC copy of A Time to Say Goodbye, which is the second volume of my Michigan Suite romances. And as always, thank you for your support of all my books. I can't believe, you know, four years ago when I started the show, I was just on two books, and now I'm on book number nine. Isn't that exciting, you know? I tell you, all you got to do is keep pushing, keep trying, and you will be able to write stuff. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Kate Breslin and her new book, High as the Heavens. If you want to call in, you can call in at 646-668-8485 and then press 1 to be live on air. Or hit me on Twitter at Parker J. Cole, hashtag write stuff with your questions and comments. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More with Parker and her guests on the Right Stuff Radio Show. We'll be right back. Have you read the latest issue of SORMAG Digital, the award-winning literary magazine for multicultural readers and writers? SORMAG Digital is available quarterly and showcases interviews with the best authors in multicultural literature. SORMAG Digital features craft and business articles for those interested in writing. If you're looking for a good book, check out our book reviews on what's hot in multicultural literature. For writers looking for new readers to get in front of, SORMAG Digital is the perfect place to introduce your book. We offer advertising spaces that fit your promotional budget. Get your free subscription on SORMAG.com or order a print issue on MAGCloud.com. If you would like more information about SORMAG Digital, check us out on SORMAG.com or contact us at SORMAG at Yahoo.com. SORMAG Digital is the magazine for multicultural readers and writers. Engaging the culture's imagination through speculative fiction, the Untold Podcast produces audio fiction from a Christian worldview. Find us over at untoldpodcast.com, where we partner with authors to tell science fiction, fantasy, supernatural, and horror stories. 
Find links at untoldpodcast.com to subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, and a variety of other platforms. Each month we produce high-quality audio fiction that's free to download and free to listen. Our submissions are open, and we're always looking to add another great story to over 24 hours of narrative entertainment. Find all of our audio fiction over at www.untoldpodcast.com. We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guests, right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome back to the show. You are listening to The Right Stuff here on WPJC 104.5. Like I said, so excited. You are here with me. We are going to be talking to Kate Breslin and her newest release, High as the Heavens. I cannot wait to delve into this book, and I'm so excited to introduce you to her today. So without further ado, I am going to welcome Kate to the show. Kate, how are you doing today? I'm great, Parker. Thanks for having me on your show. This is wonderful. It's good to meet you here and to talk to some of your readers. I am so excited you're here with me, too, because I cannot wait to delve into your new book. Can't wait to know more and more about you. One thing about doing the right stuff, Kate, is that I get to meet so many authors and get great books, and I love to introduce that to our listening audience. I'm really glad you're here. But there are some people who may not know who you are. So go ahead and tell us in your own words who you are. Well, I am an author of historical fiction uh, for uh, Bethany House Publishers, and uh, my third book is out currently. I live in the beautiful Pacific Northwest near Seattle, Washington, with my husband, who uh, I've been married to for 37 years, and we have a grown son and a grandson that live close by. Um, I love to garden and cook when I have the time. And I love to go for walks. I love to camp. Uh, I like to be outdoors, and Washington is a beautiful place to do that. We have lots of evergreen trees and mountains and just some really beautiful areas to camp in and just to, you know, just to enjoy being outside. Um, I also love to travel. I love to go around the uh, the U.S., and also I have uh, I've been blessed to go to several countries abroad with my mom, who's an intrepid traveler, and uh So I've uh, basically been doing that, and I've always been writing. I started writing uh, poetry and short stories when I was a child, and then I went on to finally novel writing when I got into, you know, uh, a little older into my 30s, and I've been doing it ever since. I find that fascinating that you mentioned about poetry. Poetry, I think it's a very wonderful art, very structured but free, and I am not a good poet. (laughs) I'm not a good poet. I've tried to write poetry so many times, and my poems tend to come out very depressing. Um, and that's why I stopped writing it years ago. I just stopped writing it. I was like, you know, this isn't working. I look like I sound like a depressed person. I'm not, but that's what's coming out. <laughs> Maybe I'm just depressed at that moment where the poetry is coming out. So I like that uh, that you say you write poetry. I think poetry is an expression. I think it's a unique well, expression of the soul. I've said it before on the show. I think it's a very unique expression. Of the soul. So what do you well, think about thank that? Thank you. Uh, when I when I was a child though I did the the rhymey poems you know birthday cards and that sort of thing for my family so bless them they put up with that but yeah as I got older I get I got and more involved in the prose and uh, you know you just it's just an expression of thought and it is writing uh, and it's helped in my writing over the years um, you know it's just uh, you know you think about metaphor and and uh, some of the ways that we write, and it is poetry, actually. It's an expression. You probably do poetry without even realizing it, Parker, when you write your book. You're probably right, and I'm probably glad I don't realize it, because the moment I realize, I'll probably stop. So that's why, you know, ignorance <laughs> is bliss sometimes. Ignorance is sometimes uh, much bliss. And so that's, uh, I just like the fact that you write poetry. I've had a few poets on the show, too, and just the their utilization of words is just beautiful. So I'm always always have to have poets on the show. I think of you as a poet first, then a writer, you know. So let's go into uh, (laughs) your writing journey. Let's go into your writing journey. And in your writing journey, on your bio, you mentioned that you used to be a bookseller who turned author. And so um, let's kind of go into that mindset real quick. How are things different for you as a bookseller as opposed to an author? Well, uh, uh, I had a lot more time to read then (laughs) than I do now. I'm pretty busy. Uh, 
it's it's kind of that ironic thing, you know. You're writing and you're you're so busy with uh, all the things involved in publishing and uh, you know social media and everything. Sometimes it's hard to get get some writing time in. I do a lot of uh, nonfiction reading with my research because I write historical novels. Uh, so it's a real treat when I get to sit down and actually you know read as a reader, uh, you know read someone else's work, a novel for entertainment's sake. That's that's a wonderful thing. I think the other thing is that, uh, and I, I kind of admit, you know, for years I was writing and I was working in the bookstores and I was all, always handling another author's book, you know, selling it. And, you know, I was very happy for them, but I kept dreaming, you know, one day, you know, would my book be the one in my hand? And, uh, you know, finally that dream came true for me. And it was it's just a wonderful feeling. So. I love hearing that. I love hearing that. And the reason why I like it is because this show is always about encouraging authors to pick up the pen and use the gift that God gave them to write. And so many people say, oh, I wish I could be an author. Oh, I wish I could be a writer. Oh, I wish I could write a book. Oh, I wish I could do that. And when you, when you take hold of your dream, when you capture it, when you hold it in your hand, and then when you hold the result of that dream, which is your book written, when you've written the end, it just changes your whole world. I totally think it changes your whole world. And here in your case, you were a bookseller holding everyone else's dreams and their accomplishments in your hands, and now you're on the other end of that. Just as a prone bookseller to an author that first time, and we'll, we'll get into a little more later, but, you know, when you finally held that book in your hand, that's your very first book, when you held it in your hand, what kind of emotions are going through you, you know, when you held I know how it happened with me. I don't want to say my stuff, but I'll start crying again. But what happened with you? How did you feel about it? Well, I was going to say, I think I started crying, too. It was oh, it was just an unbelievable moment, you know. And as we'll talk later, I it's been a very, very long journey for me to get to that point. And, you know, it was, it was just an, an incomparable feeling to sit there and hold the book in my hand and know that, you know, it had my name on the front and the words inside were my words. And, uh, yes, it's, it's just an incredible feeling. And I, I finally felt that validation, I think, a lot of aspiring authors or pre-published authors say, you know, you, you want that validation, not just for yourself, but for your family and friends. You know, it's like, hey, I'm really an author. I'm really, all this work I've done and, and uh, all these conferences I go to and the workshops I attend and, uh, you know, the hours I spend in front of the typewriter or writing in a journal or however you, you know, whatever your process is, you know, it's, it's a culmination of all that when you get that, like you said, when you get that first work finished, that first manuscript finished, it's, it's, you look at it and think, wow, I really did this. You know, I really made it all the way to the end of the book and I finished it and I have a plausible story here. So it is, it's, it's just a wonderful feeling of accomplishment. You know, you mentioned how holding that book in your hand and I think of paperback books and I remember life. I'm not that old, but I remember life before ebooks. I totally remember life before ebooks. And I remember uh, spending, I, I must have spent hundreds of dollars on books. I would go to a bookstore, especially when I was at work. I would go right across the street to the mall. There's a bookstore in the mall, and I would buy a book. And uh, the ebooks came about, about, and for the longest time, I resisted ebooks. I resisted for the longest time. Like, this is not a real book. It will not ever be a book. And then I got a uh, Kindle for my birthday. My in-laws gave me a uh, Kindle and changed everything. I said, wow, this is great, <laughs> you know? So I guess it's, <laughs> as long as you have a book in your hand, no matter what format it's in, it's good. But that leads me to my next question I want to ask you. And just as a bookseller, you know, you're coming from the world of being a bookseller and an author. Do you think e-books will completely do away with paperback books? Are they going to just take the paperback books out of the picture? Um, I really hope not. I mean, mm -hmm. uh I think that, you know, I mean, we're, we're in a new age now, and uh, electronics is here to stay. So I think mm -hmm. one day, at least with commercial fiction, uh, you're probably going to see that predominantly in the market. But I like to think that, you know, with picture books, children, beautiful children's picture books or art books or, uh, you know, some research books, that those will, you know, those will always be available in paper. Um, mm -hmm. My husband loves his Kindle. And he mm -hmm. probably reads more now than he ever has before. But I tend to favor, a, you know, I like the tactile feel of a book. I like the smell of a book. I like to be able to see what the page number is. I like to flip it over and look at the cover and then go back to the scene I'm reading. You know, those little things about a book. But, you know, honestly, electronic books, 
ebooks they have their purpose too. Like if I'm waiting for an appointment, um, I tuck my you know my Kindle or into my purse and I can pull it out and read it, and I can get lost in the story too. You know that way as well. Um, or if you're on a plane, you know, traveling. So I mean, it's got a lot of advantages. The font you can adjust the font size, which is very nice for some people. So oh, I yeah. think you know, oh, all in blast. all, there probably will always be both. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm also seeing Amazon is opening up these brick-and-mortar stores. So maybe, you know, maybe paper copies are going to be around for a while longer. I'm hoping so. I think it is the epitome of irony for Amazon, which totally blew out the competition with the brick-and-mortar stores to open a brick-and-mortar store. I just think it's the epitome of irony. I said, really, Amazon? You're, you're that yes, good. Yes, it is. You know, you bought your competition and you did what they did. You know, I just think that uh, it's just irony. But, hey, it's capitalism. What are you going to do? Right? <laughs> so we're just <laughs> having right. we're this yeah, time. This is America at work. <laughs> yes, that's how it works. You know, you got to uh, be quick on the uptake, as they say. But, you know, Amazon did help a lot of authors gain a following without having the traditional viewpoint of publishing. Because back in the day, you were validated because you got a publisher. That's how you were validated. But now with the indie author movement, uh, you can build your own tribe. So you don't have to be an NYT bestseller. You don't have to be a USA Today bestseller. You can have thousands of people who are your tribal members of your tribe and follow you. And so I do want to thank Amazon for opening up the doorways to other authors who may not have had a uh, traditional representation like we have. But I've been so I mean, traditionally published so have you, and opening that door so you don't need that validation. I think that's one of the um, advantages that Amazon gave us was, you know, having and breaking down that validation. We're having sure. the most fantastic time talking to Kate Breslin. She is the author of the new book, High as the Heavens. And we're going to talk about that in just a few moments and get back from break. If you are listening in and have a question, let me tell you, call in at 646-668-8485 and then press 1 to be live on air. Or you can hit me on Twitter at Parker J. Cole, hashtag write stuff with your question and comment. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break. When we come back, more with Kate Breslin, and pretty soon we'll be digging into High as the Heavens. Don't go anywhere. More with Parker and her guest on the Right Stuff Radio Show. We'll be right back. Question. If you write a book, everybody will rush out to buy it. Obvious answer, no. If you were a celebrity or if you had a huge marketing budget, then maybe you can get a lot of exposure for your book. Another solution would be to check out joeytweets.com. JoeyTweets.com is a promotion and marketing service with access to over one-third of a million followers on Twitter. JoeyTweets.com has three packages available to fit any budget. That's J-O-E-Y-T-W-E-E-T-S.com. JoeyTweets.com. Get some serious exposure for your books. God gives humans the gift of making amazing stories to glorify Him. At SpeculativeFaith.com, our ministry is to help fans explore fantasy, science fiction, supernatural stories, and beyond from an intentional and biblical Christian perspective. We share daily articles and have extensive archives tackling hot topics like end times beliefs, the art of writing, creative excellence in the Christian subcultures, discernment, sex, magic, Harry Potter, and space aliens and the Bible. If you are a parent or anyone else with a discriminating palate, our reviewers explore fantastical novels, movies, television, and games in light of God's beauty, goodness, and truth. Want to find Christian stories? The SpecFaith Library lists every fantastical novel we can find from a Christian author. It's all part of our mission to discern, engage, and enjoy fantastical human creativity in honor of our Creator, Jesus Christ. SpeculativeFaith.com Exploring fantastical stories for God's glory. We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guests, right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome back to the show. You're listening to The Right Stuff here with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. Let me tell you, so glad you are here with me. We are talking to Kate Breslin. She is the author of the new book, High as the Heavens. I cannot wait to delve into this. But you know what? I want to get behind the scenes with Kate Breslin. And what she has given us is some insights as to being a bookseller and to being an author. And just some insights into that. So if you missed it, don't worry. You can always download the episode later on. Uh, after we finish our broadcast, you can listen to it if you missed the first part of our interview. There's one thing I wanted to mention before we get back into our conversation with Kate. 
I had the privilege of doing and interviewing young authors. He was authors from all across the state of Michigan in conjunction with the Michigan Reading Association. Let me tell you, it was such an honor to sit there and see the new crop of future generations of authors. Let me tell you what's so important about that. Illiteracy is a problem. There are many adults who do not know how to read. I personally cannot comprehend that. I cannot comprehend that I do not know how to read, but someone out there is living that reality. It is my hope and goal that as I interview these young authors that I am used in some way by God to spark a seed in them to continue to read and hopefully to continue to write. And as I was driving away that day, back in March when I did the interviews, um, when I was driving away that day, I thought, you know what? What if I just interview the next J.K. Rowling? What if I just interview the next Karen Kingsbury? What if I just interview the next Stephen King? And that was so interesting to see maybe that something that happened there may have sparked a seed that may help that child become a great author, a great writer. And so that's why I always encourage you, those of you who listen to the show, if you have the gift to write, go ahead and write. Don't sit down on it. You can encourage your children, and that will encourage other people. You never know what the domino effect will be when you write stuff. And then I want to get back into our conversation with Kate Breslin. But for those of you who want to see the interviews I did, just simply go to my blog, therightstuffradio.wordpress.com. Again, therightstuffradio.wordpress.com. You can go to the blog, look at the videos. Oh, oh my goodness. We want to give a special shout out to the Untold Podcast. Nathan from the Untold Podcast did some, some of the children's pieces. They are absolutely brilliant. A list of that is available as well. I want to thank the Untold Podcast for their help in producing this work for the kids with the Michigan Reading Association. And then, Kate, you know, I had to say all that because, like I was saying before, I can't imagine not being able to read. I just can't imagine that, you know. And so as I was talking about this whole thing with the brick-and-mortar stores, you know, part of the joy of going back in the day to a brick-and-mortar store was the joy of discovering authors. Like, you would look at a cover, mm -hmm. and you pick up the book, you can smell the print, you can fill the pages and all that um, sensory detail. And then you go, oh, I wonder what this book's about. And you would discover a new author just because you browse through that. But I know there are other sure. authors, especially today, who are looking for visibility, which is very hard with such an explosion of the publishing industry. So what are some tips you can share for authors who want to get their books in brick-and-mortar stores? Well, as uh, when I was a bookseller, I think one of the things, uh, especially for, uh, say, someone who's self-publishing, is consignment can be a really good option, and especially in the indie bookstores. You know, I love indie bookstores because they're all about the authors. Uh, they're all about the local authors and helping them out. And uh, we would take books in on consignment from uh, authors of either small presses or self-published authors, and you can make a, a percentage arrangement with them. But at least that way, their, their books were on display. They were on a shelf. And uh, I, there were several that did really well. You know, they had a great cover. They had a great premise. Uh, they were, the writing was good, and they sold books that way. And uh, typically what you need to do there is just contact the manager of the store, and they may want to read a copy of your book first or see if you, you, know, if you have online reviews, that sort of thing, and take a look at those. So that's, that's one avenue there. Um, you know, the big thing is, is that marketing, marketing for self-published and uh, even for small presses, is a very tough thing. It's it's a lot of work. It's a lot more work than say, um, you know, when you're when you're writing for a big publisher. But hand selling, hand selling, is the most powerful marketing tool there is. People telling one another. You know, when you uh, you buy a product at a store and you're talking to your friends about it, and they go, Oh, does that you know, is that a good product? Do you like it? Because they trust you, and they trust you to tell them yes or no. You know, yes, this is great it will generally go out and buy it. So hand selling works kind of the same way. You know, one person talks to the next person. I can't tell you how many books, without my even reading, but so many people would come in and rave about someone's novel that I felt comfortable selling it to someone else who had never read it, and they would come back and say, wow, that was a great book. So, you know, hand selling is really powerful, and that's something you can really use to your advantage. And like I said, consignment's a, a way to do that. Um, the other thing is that, you know, marketing has, has changed so much in the last, you know, 20 years, 30 years. And, uh, you know, the thing of it is, is we have a lot of authors, a lot of writers out there. And like you were just saying when you were talking about literacy, that's a wonderful thing. We're in this new generation of writers. 
And uh, as long as you can come up with, say, a breakthrough concept or you've got a story uh, premise that's, you know, uh, never been done before, you're going to get the recognition. You're going to, uh, you know, you're going to light up somebody's world. Some, it's going to get across somebody's desk or it's going to uh, come across the counter in a bookstore and people are going to love it. And we've seen, you know, I think we've seen that happen to several different authors over the last several years. So I think that's a real possibility there. And again, we talked about Amazon changing kind of the face of publishing, but, you know, the brick and mortar, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing a bigger variety of the books that are being carried in these brick and mortar stores. And because uh, they do handle a lot of the, um, you know, different imprints and the, uh, the self-publishing aspects, uh, I, I think that's something to look at in the future, too. I wouldn't be surprised. Interesting you say that because so many people thought that with the advent of ebooks that brick and mortar stores would be uh, done away with. I remember I went to a book club in my local neighborhood in Detroit, and some of the it was the first time I had been there, and some of the people were bemoaning the fact that they couldn't find paperback books of some of these things. They had to actually buy either buy them or go to the library, have the library order them, things of that nature. But you know, that was several years ago, and it seems to me that paperback books are still steadily strong. And so I want to let people know, just because it's, just because something's new doesn't mean it's going to replace the old. It doesn't necessarily um, mean that. Exactly. Yeah, and like we said before, you know, I think electronic books have their place. You know, mm-hmm. they are, they're convenient, and they're small, and they fit in your purse, or, or you know, this type of thing. And, and it just depends on a person's taste, too, like I said. You know, some people really love reading on their phone or reading on their tablet. Uh, but so many others still enjoy having that book, and it makes a great gift when you can hand somebody a book, right? Um, yeah. And just just the idea of having a library, you know, having a library. I have I have a library in my office that's, you know, floor to ceiling, and it's full mm-hmm. of books, and I always want it full of books. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, think, I think that that's going to remain. And I think, uh, you know, as far as the smaller bookstores, I know it's been a struggle for a lot of them, and uh, one of the books – one of the bookstores I worked for finally closed. It just got really tough. But the thing of it is, is more of the more of the small businesses or small bookstores are being very innovative. They're diversifying, so they're carrying books and they're carrying uh, gift items and and you know the types of things that you don't find anymore in the big box stores. And I you know I think for them and they're also you know uh, doing a download service for eBooks. So they're you know they're making it and uh, and people are still. We have a local bookstore here where I live and. Uh, they they receive a lot of patronage, you know, people going in and buying books and uh, just, you know, that personalized touch and, again, you know, having the book and holding it in their hand and taking it out of the store. So That's a good point that you're making, and let's just know that we don't despise the small beginnings, you know. And I think what you're saying, too, is that they have to strategize because, because you're competing with the instant convenience of a one-click on Kindle, which is, my nightmare. I have you have no idea how many books just one click. And I looked up and I'm like, oh my gosh, where's my money? Go on. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, listen, you see that? that can that's be the, dangerous. So, yes. <laughs> that's the one thing. That's why uh, I haven't de- uh, deactivated the function of the one click, but I am more a little bit more discerning now. But uh, uh, but that's the difference between the uh, the one click and the brick uh, the paperback. You at least know, hey, this is going to cost me ten bucks to ship it out. You know, it's close to ninety nine cents to get, to get a book, and so. You can weigh the cost there. But I want to talk about your journey because I think your journey is a fascinating one. And so I want to talk about your journey to being an author. So go ahead and tell us what that journey looks like for you. Well, uh, many years ago, I um, joined uh, Romance Writers of America. Mm-hmm. I, as I said earlier, I had decided once I got into uh, my adult life and I started reading historical romance. I was a voracious reader. And uh, I finally ran out of my favorite authors, and uh, I thought, well, you know, maybe I can do this. So I decided to sit down and try to write a novel. And, of course, it's easier said than done when you're starting at the very beginning. Um, mm-hmm. But my first novel took about five years to write, and it was a Scottish historical. I was working full-time, you know, at, at, during that time, so uh, I had to work on it at night. And uh, I was trying to publish in the general romance market at the time. And, you know, I revised, I rewrote, I, you know, I went to workshops and, and, uh, you know, would learn what I was doing wrong. And, you know, so eventually 
like I said, it was it was a long five year process, and it was quite a large book to, be, uh, to begin with. So I had to pare it down a bit. I finally uh, I got a few rejection letters, and I revised again and resubmitted again. And eventually, I uh, entered the manuscript in the RWA Romance Writers of America the Golden Heart Contest, which uh, probably many know is a, a national contest for writers. And Golden Heart would be for an unpublished author. And I became a finalist with my story, and I was just so thrilled. I thought all these, you know, all these years of hard work have paid off. Well, I didn't win, and I went on to revise the book some more and resubmit to more agents and editors. And my stack of re- uh, rejection letters grew and grew, mm-hmm. and so finally, I just uh, kind of decided. You know, I thought so many times about quitting, but writing just seemed to call to me. You know, it wouldn't let go of me. Uh, so I just uh, finally I put that manuscript in the drawer and I began writing another story and then another. And I read somewhere that novel writing they said novel writing was 10% talent and 90% determination. And I don't know if that's realistic or not, but I do know that I was stubborn enough that I kept returning to the keyboard, you know, sitting down and writing. So uh, at the same time, I was starting to return to my Catholic faith too. I had been a prodigal daughter for years and I was actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming back to my faith, and I started to read the Bible for the first time, and I began to attend church. And so I was also starting to question what I was writing. Uh, And I'm not speaking for anybody else. This is my story. But what I was writing, and was this what God wanted me to do? Is this what he wanted me to put out into the world? So I continued on my own merry way, and I pretty much uh, ignored that little voice inside that kept nagging at me and nagging me, telling me to, you know, pay attention and do something else. Uh, anyway, I uh, I finally reached a crossroads uh, with my writing. I was it was several years later. I was writing a romantic comedy, and I found my first agent, and I was just over the moon. I was very thrilled, and I had by this time I had kind of you know I compromised with with God, and I had written a, a clean story, and I was still hoping to publish in the general romance market. And after some discussion with this agent. Uh, I, I compromised. I went ahead and I changed some scenes around so that because I was just so, you know, I wanted to publish so badly. Well, mm-hmm. by this time, um, the manuscript went out to 12 different publishers, and I, I, I think that that's biblical in a way. <laughs> but it so went out much. to 12 publishers, and I, I remember just feeling really awful about that. I felt like I had, you know, I had compromised my values, like I said. And, um, I just felt badly about it. So I made a promise to God then and I said, Well, if you know, if I if this manuscript gets rejected by all of these uh publishers, then I'm gonna put it away and I am going to, you know, heed the call because I had thought about writing inspirational fiction but I wasn't quite there yet. And sure enough, uh and everybody out there's probably gonna think this is strange, but I got that twelfth and final rejection letter and I was actually relieved. Mm. And so I put that book away. And uh, that's why I really believe with my debut novel for such a time, uh, God had his hand on me when I came up with the idea for that story. I was reading the book of Esther in the Bible, and uh, it struck me that the Jewish people had just been you know, persecuted throughout history in different societies. And I started to, to recall what was, you know, the most recent time that they had. And um, I, knew, uh, I knew a little bit about World War II at the time. And I knew that, you know, the Hitler's Holocaust. And I started to kind of compare that with Haman's, uh, you know, annihilation of the Jews in the Book of Esther, his attempted annihilation of the Jews. And one thing kind of led to another. And that, that kernel of a thought kind of blossomed. And I thought, well, I wonder if I could superimpose the story of Esther into this more modern venue. And so then I decided to uh, do some research and determine what kind of a setting I would have and the characters. And the story kind of grew from there. And it was a, it was an emotional journey, but it was also very much a spiritual journey for me. I think I grew in, in my faith alongside my, my characters. And once I finished the manuscript and it was uh, ready for uh, the Christian market, I, I sent it out, and doors just began to open. It was incredible. I found a really good agent, and I found my, my dream publisher. 
uh, almost overnight. I mean, it was just within a few months. Everything just happened so fast, and yet I knew, I knew that this, this is what God wanted me to do. So I, I was, I was surprised and thrilled, but I wasn't surprised. You know, it's like, yes, mm-hmm. this is, this is the time. It's for such a time. This is the time for it to happen. And so since then, I've, I've still been writing for Bethany House, and I went on to write a second book and a third. And both of those books are set during World War One, and I'm currently working on a fourth. And so that's that's my journey, and it took, like I said, many many years, and I believe that it finally uh, turned around and did what d- did what God wanted me to do, and I've never felt happier about it, and I've never felt closer to God either. So, I love how the Lord uses these events in our lives to lead us a certain way. And let me tell you, I know about rejection letters. When I was first, when I got my agent, which is a godsend, when I got my agent. Um, and we were sending out the proposals and the synopsis and all that. We were sending it out, and we sent out dozens of agents and dozens, I mean, not agents, but dozens of publishers. And you kept getting rejected and rejected and rejected. For me, it hurt. Like, every single time, I, was, I, was, I remember I was, I was doing a show at that time, and I didn't even have a contract. I was doing a show that time. And um, I just started, and I remember, like, going, I know I can write. I remember thinking that. I know I have a good product. Why are these people telling me no, you know? And I thought about that, so I know about those rejections. And because, uh, Kate, I am a uh, former Mountain Dew and marshmallow addict, uh, that was my go-to. You know, some people, uh, they they walk. (laughs) I drink Mountain Dew and marshmallows. So uh, that was my (laughs) go-to to feel better was that. And then I'll never forget, the day I had a New York Times bestselling offer on my, on my show, the very first time it happened, that was the day I got a contract from my publisher. And I remember just that feeling of, wow, you know, and, and I just felt like, like you said, the 12 rejections were biblical. I felt like here I am in the company of a great Christian author who did not compromise her values at all or anything like that. And I got this contract. It was a wonderful, it was a wonderful day. I totally feel and resonate with your story, especially how you mentioned you know, that you, you're not speaking for everybody. There are some people who are very comfortable writing um, secular romances or secular fiction. They're comfortable with that, and their faith is still attacked. That's them. I always say that's their conversation. That's between you and the Lord. I always say that, you know. But um, mm-hmm. I understand exactly where you're coming from, and I think that's a good point to make because this is a question I've always asked on the show, Kate, is are we Christian writers or are we writers who are Christian? You know what I mean? And so I think that's a yes. question we each have to answer for ourselves because our relationship with the Lord is personal and different. And I really enjoy the fact that you shared that story with us. And what we're going to do is take another quick break. I cannot wait to get into high as the heavens because World War I, there's not a lot of fiction there. I'm not, you know, there's a lot of historical fiction, right. um, but not a lot of fiction, historical romance. And I love the romance. I love romance. I love when I was 14 years old. So. <laughs> I love romance. So I cannot wait to get into High as the Heavens with Kate Breslin. And if you want to weigh in on our topic, you certainly can. Call in at 646-668-8485 and then press 1 to be live on air. Or you hit me on Twitter at Parker J. Cole, hashtag write stuff with your questions or comments. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break. We will be right back. Authors, are you looking for a new way to get your book in the hands of new audience of targeted buyers? Then a virtual book tour is for you. Right now, virtual book tours is an excellent opportunity for you to introduce your book and who you are as an author. Launching your book is very important. A virtual book tour will connect you with readers. We at WNL, we specialize in book tours, book blasts, radio tours, cover reveals, and Facebook chat. Promoting and marketing your book is what we do. Online publicity, the exposure and the publicity is what you need. Let us help you reach new readers and a new audience. We take care of everything so you don't have to. We set up the tour for you. We connect you with bloggers to advertise your book by way of interviews, guest posts, and reviews. If you are an author of a newly published book, have an upcoming release, or just want to give a previously published book new life, a virtual book tour is your answer. Check our tours out at www.wnlbooktours.com. Visit me on Facebook. I am the owner, Paulette Harper. Hi. Is your book club in need of some fresh and exciting questions to ask club members and authors at your next book club meeting? 
Literization, the book conversation game, is 70 thought-provoking questions to really get into an in-depth discussion about the books you and your club members are reading. These questions really get into the characters, the storyline, and into the author's head. These questions may just give you and your book club members a whole new way to get into a new conversation, a literization. Literization's is also a great set of tools for bloggers, interviewers, and authors to use a discussion question. Are you ready to get lit? Please visit our website at litversations.com, L-I-T-V-E-R-S-A-T-I-O-N.com. And please like our Facebook page at Simply Said Reading Accessories. Thank you. Are you a reader looking for more compelling Christian fiction? Maybe something a little more edgy or a bit more real? Are you tired of most Christian fiction shying away from the truth and settling for a rose-tinted view of the world and its issues? Or are you an author who has a compelling story to tell but you're afraid it doesn't jive with today's brand of Christian or secular fiction? Are you tired of Christian publishers telling you that your content is too edgy? Or maybe you've tried submitting your content under the radar to secular publishers only to be told your themes are a bit too religious. We invite you to take a look at the Crossover Alliance. We are an online publishing company that specializes in edgy Christian speculative fiction. Speculative fiction with Christian themes and real world content. Our company is formed from authors and readers just like you who are breaking into the mainstream and Christian markets with this compelling genre. Head over to the www.thecrossoveralliance.com for all the details on who we are, what we do, and what we accept. Right now, if you sign up for our email newsletter, you'll receive a free digital copy of our first short story anthology. Check us out today and help us spread the word about the Crossover Alliance. We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guests, right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome back to the show. I am so glad you are here with me as we continue to discuss High as the Heavens with Kate Breslin, our author for today. I'm so excited she's here with me to be with me on the show. So very glad to have you, Kate. You know, Kate, we've been talking and him and hawing around this new book. Now I want to really get into the book. So go ahead. Tell us what High as the Heavens is all about. All right. Well, I'm very excited about it. It's my third novel with Bethany House, and it just released about a week ago, or maybe a little more, June 6th, and it's available everywhere and in stores, and it is, uh, it's a World War I novel set in German-occupied Brussels. Uh, 1917 is the year, and my heroine, Eve Marche, she's a British nurse with the Belgian Red Cross, but she's also a spy working for British intelligence. Um, during a, a secret rendezvous she's about to leave for, there is a plane crash over Brussels Park, and she's the first on the scene. And when she gets to the pilot, she recognizes him, and she suddenly knows that they're both in danger. Mm-hmm. And she needs to find a way to save him in order to basically save them both. And uh, there, is a lot of, there was a lot of espionage going on in Europe during the First World War, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. Uh, Britain's MI6 basically started, I believe it was 1906 or 7 or uh, during that time. And uh, by the time the war started, the, uh, you know, the Allies and the Central Powers both had espionage and spies. And probably the most famous or infamous uh, female spy was Mata Hari, and a lot of yeah. people have probably heard that name. But there were, uh, there were others uh, in Belgium, in France, in Britain, that uh, men and women that risked their lives to save, you know, to save others and uh, got messages through. Because if you can imagine in World War I, Belgium and northern France, uh, when, the, uh, when the Kaiser's armies uh, attacked, they basically went through Belgium to get to France because that's actually who they were going to fight, but they ended up occupying uh, these areas. And so these people were living under, basically under the enemy's rule. And uh, the Belgians in particular, which is what my story centers around, uh, there were many what you would call resistance groups during that time that would uh, basically do what they could to, say, antagonize the enemy and help the allies. And uh, they did work with, you know, with British intelligence. So I was fascinated by the research I did, and I read about um, several women, but in particular there was a British nurse, Edith Cavell, 
and she was actually shot as a spy uh, hmm. because she worked in a hospital in, in Brussels, and she was actually helping to get wounded Allied soldiers out of the country so they could rejoin their regiment. And unfortunately, she was caught and, and uh, shot as a spy. And, of course, there was a lot of outrage in Britain at the time. And there were some other uh, Belgian women that uh, worked with, like I said, British MI6 and, uh, you know, getting messages across and, and uh, smuggling people out. So it was just fascinating. It was just wonderful fodder for me to write a story. And um, hopefully readers will enjoy it. There's, uh, there's also romance, of course. And uh, just a lot of intrigue and some twists and turns. So I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping people will enjoy it and will learn something from it too. I, I wanted to kind of showcase these brave people. There's so much about World War II right now. So many books, but not like you said, not much on World War One. And a lot of the organizations and a lot of the uh, innovations in World War II had their beginnings in World War One. And I, I just want to give these these unsung heroes a little credit. Unsung heroines too. So I love that. I love that. You know, I always joke that I am. If you told me, Kate, to talk in front of a thousand people in five minutes, I do it. But if you tell me to save your life, you may have to go to somebody else because I am no good in a medical emergency. And I found that out about myself uh, quite recently. Uh, I found out that I'm not very good in a medical emergency. But everyone has their gifts. My twin sister, she's better at handling medical emergencies than I am. She works in the hospital. And so I like how you use the, this, uh, this nurse and these nurses, they're supposed to be, they help these, these people, you know, and it's oftentimes the medical professionals they have that, they kind of tip the toe line. It's kind of like you have to help people because you have that oath that you vow to, but then what if you're helping someone who's, you know, an enemy or something like that? I always think that's a nice, uh, nice way to go. Or in her case, she knows who this person is, and she has to try to risk her life and help them. So it sounds like a very fascinating book. With World War I, if we could just get historical, um, historical talking real quick, America didn't enter the war at all. So is there any kind of America influence in here? Just British, it looks like. Was there any kind of America influence in here at all, or strictly just within the British uh, mindset? Uh, well, the United States did finally enter the war, but not until 1917. And World mm -hmm. War I started in 1914. So, yes, for three years, the British and the French uh, and later on the Italians were the, the allies, basically. And then you mm -hmm. had uh, – and the, and the Russians, too, for a time. We're all mm -hmm. on the Allies, and then predominantly it was the you know the Kaiser and the uh, Germany was uh, the invader, and then there were uh, uh, Austria and uh, I think one other country can't think of it right now. Uh, but eventually, through some kind of interesting interesting events, uh, the United States finally joined in the war, and it was really good that they did because if you can imagine, after three years of of trench warfare and, uh, you know, really grim circumstances, you know, poison gas and just, I mean, it was just wearing things down. And so the infusion of these, you know, fresh new troops from America, I think really, uh, really helped turn the tide on the war. And the war was, uh, you know, the armistice was declared uh, uh, November of 1918. So we're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, a little more than a year later. Oh, that's good. I just wanted to uh, kind of get an idea of what's going on there because the war, because we entered so late, we were kind of like at the, like uh, one guy told me uh, he was a World War II or World War I uh, fanatic. He was like, we kind of entered a little bit late uh, to actually be of any help. That was his thoughts. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but uh, that was his thoughts on it. But I find it fascinating that you chose this era, which is World War I. Like you said, it's not a lot of books about it, and there's a lot of books about World War II. And I think it's probably because our our families are still alive. alive. There are still veterans from that time that are still alive that we tell their stories. But I think uh, mm -hmm. recently one of the last veterans from World War One died. And one of them recently, like a couple of years ago, they recently died. He's mm -hmm. one of the last ones from World War One. He was pretty old. But um, they talk about, you know, just how war is just a horrible thing. What is it about war that brings people together? Even though we're fighting in the trenches, we're fighting our enemies, why does war tend to bring us together? 
I think, well, I can tell you what draws me to it. I mean, it, uh-huh. I know it seems grim, but the thing that, that I'm always impressed with is that, you know, ordinary people rise to the occasion to do extraordinary things. You, know, you said earlier that you don't do well with blood, but, you know, maybe in, in the right circumstances or in the wrong circumstances, uh, maybe you know, the wrong it, one. It, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, maybe in certain circumstances, you might surprise yourself. You know, I think a lot of times we don't know. And especially, you know, you look at the greatest generation, which, you know, they said was, uh, you know, the generation that endured, uh, say, World War One and then the Depression and then World War Two. You know, look at the look at the hardships and what they had to deal with. Um, you know, their minds is going to be completely different, say, than, than somebody who had never gone through that. Uh, so I think that's what fascinates me the most, because uh, especially with my story, uh, in the research that I did for my story, uh, was just, there were just so many men, women, and children, if you can imagine, that would take part in uh, different networks and organizations to to deter the you know to deter the Germans uh, through say train watching you know making sure you know watching to see uh, how many troops were coming through certain parts of Belgium and and all this information was funneling through to the British so that they had the you know so they had the edge on what was going on and these people were just you know they were surviving and and a lot of them were uh, you know food became scarce I think any time uh, uh, an, another country comes in to occupy. Uh, you know, resources get, you know, they kind of get sapped and, and pretty soon there's not enough food to go around and, and people are, you know, experiencing hardship. And yet they were still, they were still rising to that, you know, to that task to, uh, you know, their mission was to, to free Belgium or mm-hmm. to free France and win the war. So it, to me, that's pretty amazing. It's interesting you say that because when the the pressure's on, you be, you're surprised at what you can do. And maybe you're right because I just I find myself because uh, when my when I had experienced that when I found out that I really wasn't good in a medical emergency, uh, my mother looked at me. She said, "You can't be that way. Someone's going to eventually depend on you." I said, "Well, I hope not." I remember saying something like that. But it's kind of nice to know that maybe that wasn't the right circumstance. Maybe that was the circumstance that actually woke me up to the fact that hey, I need to get better at. Uh, at my hysteria and keep it down some, you know, so maybe that's um, something I have to learn over time. You know, can you believe we are almost out of time, uh, Kate? I cannot believe we just had such a fun time talking with each other and just having a great time talking about your book, High as the Heavens, and then getting into your mindset from being a bookseller to being an author and then, you know, how your journey began, which is so inspirational and everything, and I'm just so excited to have you with me as we talk about this. Now, I read a scripture before the show. I read a scripture talking about ties to heaven and the, the scripture that came from. Is that the verse, or what verse is it that relates to highest of heaven? Um, I feel called to write about the. I feel called to write about forgiveness in this mm-hmm. story. And so my heroine Eve has, um, she has a lot of uh, ghosts from the past, mm-hmm. and she has gone through gone through some pretty serious things. And so her spiritual journey throughout the story is dealing with, you know, uh, understanding forgiveness and accepting forgiveness, forgiving herself, you know. And I'm I'm hoping that that will resonate with a lot of people out there because you know, uh, sometimes we're harder on ourselves than we are on others. Mm-hmm. And we need to realize, you know, God's mercy is endless, and that includes us as well. And um, so that part of Scripture, that that Psalm, deals with uh, realizing that, you know, God's mercy is as high as the heavens, you know, from east to mm-hmm. west. Uh, and so I just thought it was fitting. And, the, you know, high as the heavens just kind of fits the story. There's a lot of references to heaven and um and anyway, I you know I wrote about forgiveness, and I I do hope that uh, you know that that readers are inspired by that, and that they realize that you know it's it's never too late for anyone. Hey Amen. That that'll preach. That'll preach, Kate. That would definitely preach. I want people to have an opportunity to follow you online. So go ahead and tell us what your social media outlets are. Okay, probably. Thank you, Parker. The easiest way would be to go to my website, which is katebreslin.com. And you can click on any of the social media links. Uh, I'm most active on Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram, and Pinterest. So if you click on those, you'll find me, and I would just I would love to connect with readers. Absolutely, that would be great. Now I know you got a couple uh, another book out. You said you're working. You said this third book that you have with Bethany is coming out, um, and you're working on a fourth book. So go ahead. Just you don't have to tell us, you know, the whole thing because we want to be surprised when we read it. But go ahead, tell us a little bit about those next projects of yours. Uh, well, the fourth book, actually, let me let me tell you first. Not by sight is my second book, and that's the World War One, and that was uh, that kind oh, of started okay. my research with World War One, and mm-hmm. I love Downton Abbey, and so uh, there was a scene in one of the seasons of Downton Abbey that dealt with uh, a, a suffragette handing a white feather of cowardice to uh, a man not in uniform, and that kind of triggered my uh, that that spark that got mm-hmm. that story going for me. And as I did the research, I learned how much, you know, uh, espionage was going on at the time, and I was just fascinated. So High as the Heavens is a standalone story with a different set of characters, but I do have one connecting uh, minor character between the two books. I like to call them connecting books. And Mm -hmm. High as the Heavens kind of picks up a month or two after Not by Sight stops. My uh, fourth book is going to also involve a character from Not By Sight, and it will take place in Europe. And, uh, again, I'm planning on some espionage, and uh, I think the story will take place in France and uh, in Spain. And so I'm just having fun working on it right now, and I've done just about all the research, and I've started writing it. So it should be available. uh, I believe it's going to release in uh, early spring of 2019. It does take me a while to write books. I write big books, and I do a lot of research. So, but nothing wrong with that at all, for sure. I know that uh, so many have responded to your books so positively and continue to keep that legacy there. What I want to do is use this last couple minutes that we have, and I want you to encourage those authors out there who God has given them the gift to write, to pick up the pen and write. Well, um, I kind of save this because you know, it's 2017, and it marks a quarter of a century. That's a long time since I began writing my very first novel. And I still keep that stack of rejection letters, and it's, it's a big stack. Uh, to remind me of my progress over the years, because, you know, we cry, we get upset when we get a rejection letter, but really that's a sign of progress. You know, we were able to submit something. We wrote something to be able to submit something to get that letter. And hopefully, if the editor has time, uh, we get a little feedback from that and we learn a little more. And, you know, that's, that's part of the process. Um, but looking back and now seeing that, you know, I'm, I'm, I've had three novels out and I'm, I'm working on the fourth, I hope that this, you know, I want to, I want to inspire pre-published authors and let them know that, you know, faith and persistence do pay off. As you can imagine, that's, that's a long time. And, you know, the thing to do is to hone your craft and polish that manuscript till it shines. And I know people hear that all the time, but it's so true, especially if it's your first time author. That manuscript being in the best possible shape it can be in is so important. Um, if you have a critique group or if you have some friends that you trust that are, are wide readers that can uh, read it for you and offer suggestions. And once that's done, you start querying the agents until you find one that loves your voice and wants to help you find, you know, a good home with a publisher for that story. And I say, too, pray always that this is God's plan for you and listen to his guidance because I've learned that you know, anything is possible with the Lord, and I, I truly believe that. And that would be my, my encouragement. Don't give up. Keep writing. You know, Kate, that was so inspirational and so inspiring. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with me on the show today. Thank you for letting us just peel back the veil and find out who Kate Breslin is all about. Thank you for sharing your books with the world. Thank you for writing this book. I can't wait to your other ones come out. And I can't wait to have you back and have you back real soon. Parker, it's been a joy. Thank you so much, and thanks to your audience. I've, I've enjoyed this podcast, and I look forward to coming back as well. Thank you. And we were talking today to Kate Breslin. She is the author of a new book, High as the Heavens, a historical fiction. 
taken place in 1919, I'm sorry, 19, <laughs> not 1997, 1917, and it's a World War I historical romance novel. Let me tell you something. You want to go ahead and get a copy of Kate's book because it's already getting rave reviews and it just came out about a week ago. So go ahead, love my sister today, and get a copy of her book, High as the Heavens, available everywhere books are sold. I want to thank you so much for joining me for this edition of The Right Stuff. For those of you in California, I will see you tomorrow. I'm looking forward to talking with you and chit-chatting with you. And as always, pick up the pen and write stuff. I am the queen of Tuesday nights, Parker J. You have a wonderful, absolutely glorious, blessed day. Thank you for joining us for this edition of The Right Stuff. Follow Parker online at parkerjcole.com. To hear this show and other shows, visit the show archive at therightstuffradio.wordpress.com. We'll be back same time next week, 7 p.m. Eastern Time.